In the spirit of disruption, I'm going to be a little disruptive. So I want you all to stand up. Please, everybody stand up. We're going to do an exercise that's called the Hindu squat. And I guarantee you that no one here, well, maybe I should ask, has anyone ever heard of a Hindu squat? Oh, there are a few. Well, I had spoken Mumbai, India to 500 Hindus, and no one had heard of it. So, uh, but it's good you have. So anyway, put your hands right out in front of you and pull them back real, real tight, and then bend down and touch the floor, or just sit on the seat there, yep. Yeah? Okay, now once again, let's do it again. Bring it in and then down here. Now when we bring it in, I want you to go boom, and then come down like that. Okay, really loud, boom, and then go down and touch the floor. Then boom, go down and touch the floor. And then boom, and go down and touch the floor. And then boom, and go down and touch the floor. One more time, boom, and touch the floor, okay. Great, now you can be seated. Now your brains are ready to learn. I'm a neuroscientist, and in neuroscience, we have to deal with many difficult questions about the brain. But I want to start with the easiest question, and the question you really should have all asked yourself at some point in your life, because it's a fundamental question if we want to understand brain function. And that is, why do we and other animals have brains? Not all species on our planet have brains, so if we want to know what the brain is for, let's think about why we evolved one brain. We have a brain for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex movements. There is no other reason to have a brain. Think about it. Movement is the only way you have of affecting the world around you. That's not quite true. There's one other way, and that's through sweating. But apart from that, Everything else goes through contractions of muscles. So think about communication, speech, gestures, writing, sign language. They're all mediated through contractions of your muscles. So it's really important to remember that sensory, memory, and cognitive processes are all important, but they're only important to either drive or suppress future movements. There can be no evolutionary advantage to laying down memories of childhood or perceiving the color of a rose if it doesn't affect the way you're going to move later in life. Now, for those who don't believe this argument, we have trees and grass on our planet without the brain, but the clinching evidence is this animal here, the humble sea squirt. Rudimentary animal, has a nervous system, swims around in the ocean in its juvenile life, and on some point in its life, it implants on a rock, and the first thing it does in implanting on that rock, which it never leaves, is to digest its own brain and nervous system for food. <laughs> so once you don't need to move, you don't need the luxury of that brain. And this, is often, this animal is often taken as an analogy to what happens in universities when professors get tenure. But that's <laughs> a different issue. Push up now every morning. Fifty years ago, President Kennedy made physical fitness a national priority. This should be a matter of concern to us all. A country uh, is as strong, really, as its citizens. Exercise became the order of the day, especially in schools. But today, obesity rates among young Americans are nearly four times as high as they were in the 1960s. And as for phys ed, only 2% of high schools in America provide daily PE. New studies suggest that exercise helps the brain function better, and that may have important implications, especially for kids. Early show correspondent Debbie Turner Bell is here with more. Good morning. Good morning. We both exercise, and I think we can attest to this. Researchers are finding that exercise can do more than keep you fit, it can also make you smarter. So, one school in Illinois has developed a program that gets kids moving and learning. Kids who took PE before they took the math class had double the improvement of kids who had PE afterwards. Exercise optimizes the brain and the person for learning. It creates the right environment for all of our 100 billion nerve cells up there. Dr. John Rady is a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and the author of Spark, a book that examines how our brains change when we exercise. It produces these, these growth factors, uh, one of which is called BDNF, and I call miracle growth for the brain or brain fertilizer which helps the brain cells stay alive, live longer, 
and it helps the learning process. Rady cites studies showing that exercise promotes the growth of new cells in the hippocampus, an area in the brain associated with memory and learning. Exercise promotes more than anything else we know, the growth of new brain cells. Rady tells us the science goes like this. When you exercise, the first thing that happens is neurotransmitters are released into the brain, keeping us awake and alert. Then, after a few minutes, exercise stimulates our nerve cells to grow and connect, creating the perfect environment for learning. I called it miracle growth for the brain, which means that it's brain fertilizer. So it helps our brain cells stay young and perky, and it also helps our brain cells do what they're supposed to do when we learn, which is to grow. Now, what's ironic is that some schools have cut back on PE in favor of more academics, when actually research is showing that physical exercise is exactly what the kids need in order to excel academically. Scandal number one, where the only mystery lies in why we're not fixing it. If you were to design an almost perfect anti-brain learning environment, it would look something like this. Why? Because tiny proteins called BDNFs are actually created when you exercise and act like miracle grow for your brain. Brain rule number one, exercise boosts brain power. 